Our next speaker is Mark Davis, also from Stanford. He's speaking on uh, the potentially important TSA activity in uh, MECFS. So I, I'm also very grateful to uh, Joe Bream and, and uh, uh, NIH for sponsoring this meeting. It's a really timely meeting, and I think it, the meetings like this uh, haven't been common enough and, and help to mobilize people and, and get them thinking and interacting uh, in, in very useful ways. Um, now, I uh, came to this, uh, to this area in a kind of unusual way, uh, which is that, that we've been um, very concerned with uh, the lack of uh, useful tools, uh, precise tools in human immunology. And um, have taken on a mission uh, that Jose mentioned in terms of a, our uh, overall effort at Stanford, but um, specifically develop tools to understand T cells and other kinds of cells that, that are uh, important in immune system in both health and disease. And, and one of the really useful tools uh, that we developed, and it'll become clear why it's useful, is um, a few years ago, a, a really nice single cell uh, T cell method that could produce uh, T cell receptor sequences. And for uh, those who don't know, a T cell receptor is like an antibody-like molecule on T cells. So it has a, a vast amount of uh, sequence diversity that it gets by rearranging V and D and J regions, just like antibodies. Um, and then this is what's on the surface of T cells and allows them to distinguish uh, self from non-self antigens. And this uh, method uh, Arnold Hahn developed um, is, is really a very uh, efficient way. You can just have a few T cells and you'll get these sequences. And you can tell things like, are they clonally expanded? Now, one of the primary features of a lymphocyte response is that you create this vast amount of diversity uh, through this gene rearrangement met method. And in general, each cell expresses uh, a different receptor. Um, and you're just expressing every possible receptor. And then uh, if the right antigen comes along, it can trigger those cells. Uh, and then the particular cells that have a specificity for that virus or whatever it was uh, will divide and create many more daughter cells that have exactly the same sequence. So just looking at that, those expansions, those what we call clonal expansions in uh, immunology, tells you something about what cells got most excited about um, this particular thing. Uh, and if it happens to be a viral infection, then they're going to be most excited about viral antigens that, that have been coming in. Um, in autoimmune diseases, there's uh, a downside, which is they're going to be excited about self-antigens, which is not what they're supposed to, but that's because of uh, a problem with regulation. And, and that's, um, I go back to this title here, the subtitle, which is, is, is this an autoimmune disease? Uh, because actually, um, what Jose just told you in terms of this correlation with inflammatory cytokines and also a correlation with particular uh, class II uh, HLA molecules. Uh, this is a hallmark of autoimmune diseases. Uh, and, and typically, um, ME-CFS is not thought of as an autoimmune disease because there's some other, uh, there just hasn't been that much work in it. But, but this has been um, what it increasingly looks like to us. And I'll, I'll take you through uh, our data in terms of how, uh, what suggests that. So, let me just uh, so tell you that this, this is, um, we have this methodology and created a whole series of methodologies with our colleagues at Stanford to explore the immune system of human beings in, in much greater detail than was previously possible. Uh, and one of the funny phenomena, and, and um, um, as mentioned earlier, curiosity. I mean, this is, again, sort of the PhD world is that uh, we see things that we don't understand, and uh, we try to um, do th experiments to understand them. So uh, another great idea Arnold had was to look at celiac disease. And, uh, and celiac disease is the only autoimmune disease where we have a very sure knowledge of what the antigen is. Namely, it's a, a gluten. Um, and so if you go on a gluten-free diet, generally, although not, not always, um, you can cure the disease, and then everyone's happy, mostly. 
Uh, but it's also, you can do studies with gluten. You can ask uh, celiacs on a gluten-free diet to take gluten as part of an experimental study, and that's what we did. Um, and uh, like other studies have shown that uh, six days later after consuming gluten, uh, we could see gluten-specific CD4 T cells uh, in the blood of these patients. It's kind of like there's a local response and then uh, cells divide and then, um, then on the sixth or seventh day they come out into the blood and you can uh, examine them in great detail and they're generally enriched for specificity. Um, and so that's all well and good. That's what happened here in the CD4 category. But what was surprising and piqued our curiosity completely was that we also saw CD8 cells and gamma delta T cells. And these are other flavors of T cells that do quite different things than CD4 T cells. Uh, particularly CD8 cells are famous for killing uh, virally infected cells. Gamma delta cells are, are, are a bit of a mystery in, in the immune system. But anyway, this whole panoply of different T cells coming out with the gluten uh, was completely surprising and not, um, not on anyone's radar screen in terms of this autoimmune disease. And uh, so we thought, well, is this something that people have missed in other autoimmune diseases? And the easiest um, thing to do here was to look at one of the several mouse models of autoimmune disease, and this is one called EAE, where you induce uh, disease with uh, a particular myelin protein called MOG and some complete Freund's adjuvant and other, other terrible things to stimulate an autoreactive response. And sure enough, around day 10 or so, uh, these mice develop a demyelinating disease, and, and this has been uh, a, a very popular model for multiple sclerosis for, for many years now, decades, in fact. So uh, long story short is we saw exactly the same thing in EAE, which is that we saw a spike of CD4 cells together with a spike in CD8 cells together with a spike of gamma delta cells. And then as a special bonus, uh, we saw a week later, we saw a spike of exactly the same uh, trio of, of cells. So this says that it's uh, that this is something much more general than just a peculiarity of celiac disease. Um, but there was more to the story, um, and that came about when we employed this uh, single-cell T-cell receptor characterization method, and we could, sure enough, see clonal expansion in the blood and in the central nervous system with CD4 cells, um, and also uh, especially CD8 cells and also gamma delta cells that are not showing here. Uh, so that's, that's good, and that told us these are the cells to look at. Uh, these are the ones that are the most active in the disease, and we should follow up on uh, asking what do they actually do and what do they recognize. And these have been some of the central mysteries of autoimmunity and, and a lot of things associated with human immunology. So long story short is, uh, I should say, Nerisha Saligrama, the picture I showed before, is that one really did most of this work. Um, and basically, if we transplant the T cell receptors that we derive from these sequences uh, into uh, uh, reporter cells, uh, we can see that uh, all the expanded uh, CD4 cells that we uh, analyze all recognize the MOG peptide, which is fine. That's how you induce the disease. It makes sense that the pathogenic T cells are that, as other people have uh, talked about as well in this model. But what was interesting was that the CD8 cells, also very expanded, uh, didn't recognize MOG. None of them did. These are controls over here. Um, and, and not only didn't they recognize MOG, they didn't recognize any other myelin proteins. And this is strange because um, in viral responses, the CD4 cells and the CD8 cells recognize the same molecules, and definitely molecules from the same virus, because they have to work together to kill uh, the viruses. Uh, so this was something pretty much off the uh, track. And so long story short is we isolated peptides from, uh, that stimulated these CD8 cells, and we put them in with the um, MOG peptide mix that induces the disease, expecting we're going to stimulate CD8 cells. They're going to make the disease worse because they're going to be cooperating with the CD4 cells uh, to, um, uh, to kill uh, myelin cells and cause this sort of um, demyelinating disease phenotype. 
But uh, in fact, what happened was that we cured the disease and uh, seven of 10 mice had no disease whatsoever and three of the 10 had a very mild uh, form. This is the clinical score here. And if, if you just do the regular thing, you get 10 out of 10 mice that have a pretty severe clinical disease. But, but this is what happens when we put in these CDA peptides. So, so that's something. Um, or really what it says is that uh, we're seeing something very different than what we see in an infectious disease response, which is we're seeing that the clonally expanded CD8 T cells in this mouse model actually suppress the disease. And could this be true in human autoimmune diseases? And if it is, then finding the ligands for those CD8 cells in, in autoimmune disease might be, um, might be a drug. So, uh, so we've been um, hot on the trail here with, in, in MS, um, and particularly collaborating with a group at UCSF that has a really nice study of, um, of MS patients, and particularly was able to get us uh, almost 20 patients of recent onset um, that had not been treated. There are many immune modulatory drugs for MS, and these are just people just coming into clinic. So they, we, we didn't have to worry about the effects of those drugs. Um, and what was remarkable is that compared to healthy controls, which sometimes show a bit of uh, colon expansion, but other times don't, uh, we could see almost every MS patient had a massive CDA colon expansion in their um, in the activated blood cells. So that suggests there could be the same things going on in, in this uh, major human autoimmune disease. Uh, but you're asking, this is a, a symposium on ME-CFS, where's, where's that? Uh, where's the beef? Uh, I, but this is just the introduction to get you warmed up to, to thinking T cells might be really important. Uh, but are they? Are they really? Uh, most people haven't paid any attention to T cells in, in this, this disease. So, uh, so this is where the accident hallway conversation between my graduate student, uh, Jacob Glanville, and Dr. Montoya, who you just heard from. And Dr. Montoya had a lot of T cell receptor sequences from both patients and controls uh, that he was looking for someone to tell him something about, because it's not really obvious a lot of times what you can do with a whole bunch of T cell receptor sequences, especially just from one half of the receptor, the beta chain. Um, and Jake, being ever optimistic, um, took, took this on as a kind of side project and uh, sort of immediately found that there were a lot of similar T cell receptor sequences in the patients, but not in the controls. And uh, he came to me and said, oh, this is a project. We gotta find now some single cells. And so uh, that's what we've been doing. Um, and we particularly went back to that cohort. We, we could see that a, a bunch of them had the, um, the, mo the most prominent, most common uh, class 1 MHC that went along with these shared sequences. And so we collected uh, half a dozen people and started to work on their T cell receptors. And in fact, uh, we could tell that uh, all of them had colonal expansions of the CD8 cells. Um, we've subsequently seen some clonal expansions in healthy controls and, and we're trying to figure out what, what that means. But, but still, this was, this was quite striking and encouraged us to uh, move on and take the now pairs of expanded CD, uh, T cell receptors and, and uh, do something with them. But what can you do with them? Well, so this is another uh, segue here where uh, Jacob in his uh, day job uh, actually uh, did something very remarkable in the world of T cell receptor sequences, which is he, he figured out some basic rules for uh, clustering T cell receptors that could predict specificity. And a long story short is that uh, by sequencing T cells brought, uh, brought in with a particular specificity, he could find common sequences and sequence motifs that turned out to be in structures, uh, turned out to be the contact points between the T cell receptor and the uh, peptide in the groove of the MHC. I'm sorry I didn't show you an overall picture of a T cell receptor. This is part, the business end of a T cell receptor uh, and this is its ligand, which is a peptide in, uh, in this, uh, these curly cues here, that, which is the, 
the tops of the MHC or HLA molecules. But anyway, these were conserved because they were the contact points that's always more conserved in a protein-protein interaction. Um, and, but the, the important thing was that he was able to use this data to develop an algorithm uh, called Glyph, and that this algorithm is a way to uh, scan through thousands of T receptor sequences and to find uh, ones that share specificity. And why is this important? Well, the, the sequence diversity of T receptors is so vast that even identical twins share uh, almost none of their sequences uh, exactly, uh, but yet they share a lot of specificities. And so what's biologically interesting and important uh, in any disease is what is the actual specificity versus, yes, there are a thousand different sequences that can uh, have the same specificity, but, but really it, it's much uh, more important to find specificities. So, um, so this is what we were able to do. And the, the proof of the pudding of this uh, algorithm was the fact that we could take almost 6,000 sequences in a TB study that were TB specific we thought uh, CD4 T cells in latently infected uh, people in a South African cohort, and that we could uh, see many dozens of, of glyph groups, the specificity groups, and particularly the ones that were most popular are these five here that were shared by four or more people, uh, but, and we could immediately see that they were also, they tended to share a particular uh, class two MHC allele, which was is important because it, uh, it, it enables you to understand, okay, what the likely uh, MHC allele is, and that's important for uh, a lot of all the efforts to find what the specificity is. Um, and indeed, it helped us to find the specificities quickly, and we could find all five of these specificities. They all recognize a different uh, TB peptide in a different class two MHC. So that says the algorithm is actually uh, quite accurate at predicting specificity groups uh, and organizing sequences that are otherwise uh, almost impossible to organize uh, coherently. Um, and so these are some of the sequences, the groups that have come out now of, of these patients that share the A2 allele. Um, and this just gives you a flavor for uh, the different specificity groups. And highlighted are the central parts, the, the motif parts that are shared. In, and what we imagine to be the, the contact points. Um, and so uh, what do you do now? Well, you now can uh, use this uh, great methodology developed by uh, Chris Garcia downstairs at Stanford, who uh, has been able to engineer particular MHC molecules onto yeast, and then to uh, put as many as a, a billion different peptides into that one MHC molecule uh, such that each yeast is making a different peptide, and then you can screen that yeast library with uh, particular T cell receptors in a multimeric form, and uh, on a good day, come up with a, uh, uh, a peptide. And that's what we did. Uh, unfortunately, we, we made 10 different T cell receptor pairs to screen uh, this work of Santosh Kumar, who was a, a postdoc in the lab, uh, and we only got one uh, hit that came out, uh, this one here, and this is uh, the result of uh, multiple rounds of selection. But anyway, there, that's, that's what happened. We have this one peptide, and now let's look at this peptide. Well, and these, the same peptide came out of different libraries. Um, but a long, long and short of it is that uh, by uh, making reporter cells of this, uh, this T cell receptor, we we're able to see uh, and, and making peptides that were similar to library peptides, we could find a hit uh, in this um, peptide from this molecule FGF2, uh, and another hit actually here, uh, FBRS, and other ones are, are somewhat uh, shaky, but uh, there's no obvious uh, neurological or immunological connection here with, the, with these two uh, major hits, but uh, anyway, we went, we went with them further. Uh, but what was particularly interesting was did any of these uh, look similar to pathogenic peptides? Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, we did find uh, 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 not only similar sequences, but uh, activation pattern uh, is shown here. These are, these are good activators here. 
very robust, and two of them were from uh, mycobacteria. Uh, another one was from Citrobacter, um, and then there's this other one, uh, Lupinus, uh, whatever that is, so Lupin. Um, a fish, maybe, forget. Uh, so anyway, there's cross-reactivity, uh, which is actually not too hard to find if you, have, if you start with a peptide sequence, look for other things in the databases for other. So this was very promising that we could see both the self-reactivity and a, a potential uh, pathogen, although how often people might be infected with these mycobacteria, we don't know, but maybe there was unknown, unknown, unknown one that is common here. Um, and so then we went to this other methodology that, that we actually developed uh, quite a few years ago called uh, peptide MHC tetramers, which is basically a trick for multimerizing a particular peptide MHC and then staining T cells with it because the affinity is very low. You, you can't do this with monomers typically. You need a, a multimeric form. Um, and um, again, a long story short is that uh, in 10 uh, patients from Jose's cohort, uh, we only found one uh, that had significant T cell staining with this reagent. That was very disappointing. Uh, it might be important for this one person, but it's, it's so rare it couldn't it'd be hard to imagine this is a, uh, the real deal. But there's still hope because uh, we do see in the tetramer positive cells uh, from three of the patients, including the one I just showed you, uh, we, we have seen some sequences that are similar. And, so there's something to pursue there. It's not, but it's not a, it's not a home run in terms of uh, uh, saying that okay, this is something common to many, uh, many patients because it isn't. So that's um, encouraged us to really um, uh, start up again with actually now a more diverse cohort, um, and these are patients that have, have come in uh, to. Um, uh, in, into Ron Davis's program, and particularly Julie uh, Wilhami, who's a, uh, a technician that's uh, uh, with both Ron and myself. Uh, we've got a whole new uh, cohort of people, 21 uh, diagnosed patients and 17 healthy controls. And now again, we're, we're sequ we have sequenced now over 10,000 t cell receptor sequences. Uh, we're just now, I'm told, uh, today or tomorrow we will get uh, HLA typing on, on all those people, and we'll be able to uh, start up again looking for motifs. And, and we've done some preliminary work, and we do see some new motifs, and, and so that'll be the basis of, of, of things. These are some of the uh, clonal expansions. But as I say, we also see clonal expansions now in some of these healthy controls, which is puzzling compared to our other experience. But uh, we'll work through that, and we do see uh, sequence motifs that are coming up in the patients that are not coming up in the uh, healthy controls. So at least that's, uh, that's encouraging that we can, we can get back on track in terms of tracking down uh, particular specificities and, and using the uh, tools that I've mentioned. And this is just a, a summary of those tools uh, where basically we can go from single T cells in any situation to sequences, sequence pairs, which are, is critical for reconstructing a specificity to analyzing thousands of sequences or actually millions of sequences now uh, with a, a, a more advanced version of the glyph algorithm, uh, look for shared specificities, and then go after the, uh, what those specificities are, either with reporter cells, as, as I mentioned, or these, um, or these libraries. Uh, and uh, we've... Uh, talked about some of those things in, in some of these, these uh, papers is in general, although most of this data is not published. Um, and uh, so future directions, uh, as I say, we're, we're, we have now a whole new cohort, a whole new set of sequences to work with and, and to get more, uh, obviously to get more peptide hits, maybe more uh, MACs than, than just A2. Uh, also really interested in whether with uh, longitudinal studies, can we correlate some of these T cell activities with ups and downs of, of, uh, uh, of people's clinical experience? And uh, this, uh, talking to you, Jared, uh, in terms of how this might work. Um, and uh, we also would like to look at CD4 cells because we're now thinking that these CD8 cells might be suppressive, which would be good in terms of 
uh, possible therapies, uh, but we also, you know, what is the causative T cell? And that's probably in the CD4 neighborhood as it is in most autoimmune diseases, especially those that ha are linked to a particular class two MHC, which is, or HLA, which is, describes most people. Um, and we could also get clues from uh, some, some of the antibody work. Uh, we've also uh, started a collaboration with Somalogic, which can survey uh, 5,000 analytes, and they've uh, agreed to uh, uh, look at uh, Jose's patients uh, for a very nominal uh, amount of money. So that's very, very nice of them. Uh, and of course, none of this would be possible without a lot of very uh, talented postdocs, uh, students, and technicians. And I mentioned Santosh. I didn't mention so much uh, Vamsi, uh, uh, current postdoc. Um, it's really uh, doing great stuff on this. Huang Huang and, and Jacob uh, are doing most, uh, done mostly the, the TV work, but uh, Jacob, as you say, he moonlighted with uh, uh, Jose to do some, get us started in this uh, ME-CFS field. Uh, I mentioned Arnold Pond, uh, Julie, um, Narisha Saligrama, and some other folks in the lab, and, and critical collaborators like Jose and Ron, and, uh, in the MS study, Jorge Oxenberg and Stephen Hauser, um, and, and Chris Garcia has also been huge. Uh, and uh, we had uh, a lot of su uh, support from uh, agencies, including the Open Medicine Foundation, uh, Linda. Uh, and I wanted to close with something completely unusual that I just added because um, this is a line in out of Africa that, that struck me. Um, like all quacks, I had many patients. And this is a warning to the uh, patients here that uh, what you're hearing here is real science by serious people uh, trying to figure this out. There are other people in um, the universe who will sell you solutions, what they think, what they will tell you are solutions, but they don't actually know. Um, and. Um, and, and in situations where there is no good medical advice or treatments, uh, there's a natural tendency to seek those people out. Uh, hence uh, this, this comment. So I just uh, leave you with this because maybe it'll be helpful. Okay, and I'll stop there. Thank you.